today we're going to be talking about work. Not just any work, but, but God's work and, and our work. And I want to start by telling you a story. And it's, it's not a true story, but it's a story that I've heard often enough in different variations uh, that there's a ring of truth to it. Um, there was a, a brilliant young woman. She was studying at Johns Hopkins to be a doctor. She was in her first year of residency. She was at the top of her class in one of the best medical schools in the world. And one evening at her small evangelical church, they had a meeting. And at that meeting, there was a, a team of people that came from the parts of the world where it is not safe to be a Christian. And as they shared story after story of the kind of work that God was doing in those areas, in the Middle East and in Northern Africa, this young woman's heart was touched. She would say that she felt the call of God on her life. God was calling her to do God's work. And based on her understanding of what that meant, she made a, a huge sacrifice. She went to her professors. She went to the dean of, of students, and she said, I'm done. I've been called to the mission field, and I'm going to spend my life serving these people who've never had a chance to hear the gospel. And as a bright young woman, she enrolled in a seminary because she knew she didn't have the preparation that she needed to share the gospel truly and effectively. And three short years later, she graduated again at the top of her class because she was bright. She was dedicated. She was driven. And after she had raised funds, she flew over to these Areas that are closed off to most people. And she found the, the man who had come to her church. And she spent the next five years ministering beside him. Sharing the gospel. Five years and one day later, she was back in the United States. Bitterly disappointed. For five years, she'd be been surrounded by poverty, by sickness, by disease. Her words, despite her intentions, hadn't been very effective. She had not seen very many people come to Christ. The stories that she had heard had not characterized her own life. And she cried out to God. And she said, God, was it for nothing that you called me to do your work? Wasn't I happy in medical school where I was thriving and healthy? Can you imagine what God might say to her? If God were to speak in an audible voice, which he does so rarely. But if he did, can you imagine what he might say. We're going to come back to that. But this young woman has an experience that flows from her understanding of what it means to do God's work. And that is an understandable, um, an understandable thing given our complex inheritance as Western Christians. The story of of our understanding of work begins in the ancient Greek world. The Greek world characterized by um, a spirit-body duality, which would later infect the church as a heresy that we call Gnosticism. The belief that the spirit is good and the body is evil. And so great philosophers like Epictetus and um, Aristotle put forth this view that since 
reality is ultimately spiritual. And the body is ultimately a corruption of that reality or a lesser shadow. That those things which are more spiritual are more good. And those things which are less spiritual are, are less good. In fact, they would even go so far as to say the things of the body are more like animals. They're beastly. Whereas the things of the soul are good and holy. Let me read you a quote from Aristotle's Politics. He says this, When there is such a difference as this between soul and body, or between men and animals, as in the case of those whose business is to use their body and who can do nothing better, the lower sort are by nature slaves. And it is better for them, as for all inferiors, that they should be under the rule of a master. What's he saying here? He's saying that there are kinds, he's saying that work is, is a kind of a curse. It is a necessity. And that those people who do work with their body, the farmer, the carpenter, the craftsman, are more like beasts. They're animal. He'll go on to say that those people who are made for the work of the hands are going to be big and strong, just like, just like an ox, just like an elephant, because they're made for nothing more, and they can do nothing better than to work with their hands. On the flip side, those whose work is more spiritual, more intellectual, a philosopher, for example, is work that is good and holy. Now, Aristotle the Stoics, they knew that even the philosopher had to work. And so they constructed a society based on the, the labor, the unpaid labor of slaves that supported the leisure of the upper class, of the elite. And so you have this idea, work is bad, work is for the lower class, leisure is good, leisure is for the upper class, right? And as Rome became Christian, that Gnostic understanding kind of infiltrated our system of beliefs and we became Neoplatonists and we, we inherited Greek philosophy. And so the majority position by 400 AD until, let's say, 1400 AD, was the same. The only difference is we replaced the philosopher with the bishop and the priest and the monk. And we replaced the carpenter with the carpenter. I mean, the lower class, even uh, the aristocracy under the Catholic understanding at the time would be part of that beastly realm. And they used different words. They would say that there was a spiritual realm where the, the Pope lived and the bishops and the, and the priests and the nuns and the monks and then everybody else, be they king or be they peasant, lived in what's called the temporal realm because in their understanding there was spiritual work and there was unspiritual work. Now Martin Luther um, in that kind of combative way that he had uh, attacked this view, but it's still part of our heritage. Martin Luther said this. Martin Luther said, it is pure invention that Pope, bishops, priests, and monks are called the spiritual estate, while princes and lords and artisans and farmers are called the temporal estate. This is indeed a piece of deceit and hypocrisy, yet no one need be intimidated by it, and that for this reason, all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate, and there is no difference among them except that of office. We are all consecrated priests by baptism. As St. Peter says, you are a royal priesthood and a priestly realm in 1 Peter 2. And the apocalypse, which we call Revelation, says, thou hast made us to be kings and priests by thy blood. And so that piece of our heritage was torn down to an extent, but it it never really got torn all the way down. And so we find ourselves today 
500 years later, specifically in America, heir to um, what Max Weber called the, the Puritan work ethic, the idea that work is good. And, and that idea, we not only transcended the idea that all work is spiritual or all Christians are part of the, the spiritual estate, to saying that all work is spiritual, to saying that work is more than God. And that view is summed up in Ayn Rand, who was a major influence on uh, leading thinkers in America for the last 50 years. She said this in her book, Atlas Shrugged, there is nothing of any importance in life except how well you do your work. Nothing. Only that. Whatever else you are will come from that. It's the only measure of human value. Have you ever felt like that? Felt like that you are your job? That your job defined you, it gave you your worth? Or maybe you've heard this ancient millennial proverb um, from millennials, not from the millennium. Um, Don't live to work, work to live. Right? It's the opposite idea. It's saying, like, listen, we work. Work's not important. Work's got nothing for me. I do work so that I can do what I want. I do work so that I can travel. I do work so I can spend time with my family. Work is a necessity. I do it because I have to, but I do as little as possible so that I can focus on my real life. My real life, which is what I enjoy, what I love. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever heard those words? And you know, the, the two people, the two groups of people that hold to those ideas tend to be on opposite sides of the economic, political, social spectrum. But what we're going to discover to get to, to, together today is that they both hold to a sub-Christian view of work. It is not possible first to say that work is a meaningless necessity. Why? Well, first, how does the Bible start? Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Our tradition has tended to focus on the act of creation and how that works in apologetics. But it is equally as important to the story to notice that God does the work of creation. God does the work of multiplication, of bringing order from chaos. And he declares his work to be good in itself. The work of God is good. And if we follow that stream of work consciousness, we'll see that God works in many different ways throughout Scripture. And Psalm 65, again, says God's a gardener. He cares for the land. He waters it. He enriches it abundantly. In Deuteronomy 10, God gives the law. He functions as a lawyer and a scribe. He writes down the law for Moses. He chisels out on two stone tablets the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And John 16 talks about the Holy Spirit. God, the, the Holy Spirit, functioning as a teacher who will guide us into all truth. He won't speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. God is a teacher. Second Kings and all through the Old Testament, we see that God sometimes is a soldier, a protector, a defender. God says, I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. And lest we forget, Jesus was, although he functioned as a rabbi for the latter part of his career, until he was 30, he was a carpenter. And people recognized him as such from the calluses on his hands and the scars on his body. If God does the work, how can we say it's not good? If God does the work, God who is spirit, how can we say that work is not 
in essence, spiritual. Right? So we have to tear down that first divide. And our culture is, is so good at splitting things apart to understand them. And that's really helpful in a lot of ways. But to come to true wisdom, we have to be able to take those things that we've split apart to understand them better, and then we have to put it back together and understand again. And the first thing that I want us to understand is that work is spiritual and it is good. Why do we work? Have you ever thought about that? I think a lot of people, by reading the scripture a little bit too quickly, they jump to the curse on work, and that's the, the lens through which they look at work. It's like, man, if, if we were back in the garden, we'd just be picking apples, relaxing. If you remember from your childhood, perhaps, the images in cartoons and media of, of what life will be like after death, it is always that ancient Greek pagan idea, sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, chilling out, doing nothing, reading on the beach, whatever it is, it's surely not work. But let's just take a little look, shall we? Let's go back to Genesis 1. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Great, leisure. Um, but then he said, fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now I'll make two quick but important points. When he says rule over the fish and subdue the earth, there's two things that is not talking about. First, it's not talking about using up the earth as if it's a piece of trash or something created just for our use. Um, like a herd of locusts that just eat something to the ground. That is not what it means to steward God's creation. On the other hand, God doesn't say, don't change anything, fellows. Just like we're going to keep the garden real nice and everything's going to be cool. That's also not it. There's, there's this idea that we are made in God's image, that we have been given creativity. And somehow, just like God worked in those first seven days to bring order from chaos, to bring creativity, to express creativity in, in the variety of his creation, so too, to a lesser extent, we are to express our creativity, to express our rulership as um, subordinates of the Most High God to do the same thing. Genesis 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and take care of it. Farming is the first work. So people who look down on physical work have obviously got it wrong. People who say that work isn't good obviously got it wrong because before there was sin, when all there was was God, it wasn't a holiday. There was work because work is good and work is spiritual and it's part of our purpose as humans. We work because God works and we are made in his image. Do you see that? As it says in the scripture that we are created in God's image, so God explains that therefore we have a role to steward the earth, to rule over it, and to subdue it. Then our second sidetrack, because of our cultural milieu, I want to read for you Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day God rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, we're not talking here about the Sabbath, whether it should be on Saturday or Sunday, or whether it can be any day. That's a theological discussion for another time, right? What is obvious is God didn't rest from creation because he got tired. God rested from creation because that's the kind of thing that God does. Humans, therefore, also rest from their work 
Not because they're tired, not because they can't take one more step, but because resting is an act of faith in God and resting is an expression of the values of the kingdom. God in God's self said six days on, one day off. I mean, are you going to get out of that work rest cycle that God has instituted? And too often, we all do. We work because God works. We're made in God's image. We rest because God rests. And we're made in God's image. They're two sides of the same thing. So against Ayn Rand, who idolizes work, we will say that work is not God, but it is good. And it is spiritual. But it's not everything that we thought it would be, is it? No matter how idealistic you might have been, like I might have been, going into your work as I went into mine, no matter how high or promising the premise, feeding the poor, healing the sick, taking care of people, feeding people, educating the young, it doesn't quite live up to the hype, does it? And that also is evident in Genesis, Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve both decided to disobey God, to place their faith not in their father, but in a deceiver, and God pronounced judgment. And here's the judgment that he pronounced to Adam. To Adam he said, because... You ate the fruit from the tree which I, about which I commanded you. You must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food. Until you return to the ground. Since from it you are taken. For dust you are. And to dust you will return. Now there's a rhetorical figure here that we call metonymy which is where one thing stands for the whole. Adam is a farmer. The cursing of the ground is both literal, but it's also the curse of farming and therefore work of all kinds. And so to say that you can find your meaning in work is to misunderstand what work is. Work is not a curse. That was a misunderstanding by the Greeks, right? Childbearing, painful. Childbearing is not a curse, nor are children. Work is now frustrating. It is now hard. Sometimes it feels fruitless. But it is still rewarding. There is still beauty and meaning inside of it. But it's not the meaning of life. God is the meaning of life. It's a given or it should be a given that no matter what you do for your job, for your work, it's going to be affected by sin in the fall. It's going to have its moments. It's moments of trial. It's moments of difficulty. Moments where a lack of perfect humans in this world is going to make things way harder than they should be. And as a sinful human yourself, just like I too am a sinful human, our response to work can also be a source of, of sin. Work can become your source of value, just like it can become my source of value. I may feel more proud because I get a better job, better in the eyes of people. Um, I can become pride. I can use work to avoid other problems. I can use providing for my family as an excuse to avoid my family. I can use the income that I get from my work to dominate other people. I can use my position in ways that aren't appropriate. I can use my work as a way to be independent from God, as if I didn't need God. Work is good, and it is spiritual, but it's under the curse. It's never going to be, and it never should be, God in your life can't set up an idol in your heart to your work. 
And what I want us to look at in particular today is that our work now, in this time, as people of faith, bears witness to, testifies to God's work. Colossians 3.22, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do that not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Let's stop there just for a second. This is about slaves and masters, and a lot of you are already probably maybe a little distressed, maybe a little distracted, because your understanding of slaves and masters is entirely dependent upon your cultural understanding of what American mm, slavery uh, and masterhood meant. And without going into all the details, this is a different society with a different system. But in any case, the principle will stay the same because a slave is, is a lower position than an employee today in our modern democracy. An employee has more rights for the most part than an ancient slave did, at least in, a, in an American setting. And so if it was for a slave to obey who was farther beneath or the more extreme case, then surely we must do the same. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Why? Because you don't work for them first, even though they're this far above you. Jesus is farther above them. You work for the Lord. And by your work for the Lord, you bear witness to, you testify to the values of the kingdom, to your earthly master. And you will receive a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving in everything that you do. And then he f flips it around. As we continue, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now, a master is a step above the boss. The, the distance between boss and employee tends to be, on average, less than that between master and slave. But even though you're not as high above your employee as a, as a boss or a manager or a supervisor, as a slave is, as a master is above the slave, still you are to provide what is right and fair. Why? Because you have a master. The kingdom of God and its values, in fact, every part of what we do today, including our work. And so we express the values of our kingdom through the way that we do our work. So let's go back to our missionary. This understanding that many of us have and have had that the sacred and the secular are different, that, that work is unholy and temporal and, and normal, and that there are some people who do this other kind of work that's spiritual and holy. We've seen that that's false. It's not biblical. Martin Luther yelled against it 600 years ago. We're still yelling against it today. In the same way, to do Christian work doesn't mean to talk about Jesus all the time. It doesn't mean to put a golden fish on your shoes if you're a shoemaker. It doesn't mean that Christian musicians only play Christian music. It doesn't mean Christian writers can only write stories about Jesus. It doesn't mean Christian businessmen and businesswomen only make products like Christian bookmarks for Christian people. That's to make the same mistake again. Better to see, or better to see the gospel as a lens through which we see the world. 
to ask ourselves this question. In what part of my job are the values of the kingdom not important? How many moral decisions do you have in your work when you choose whether to be diligent or lazy, whether you choose to express your creativity or to check out, whether you choose to invest, how you choose to treat other people. Is this not spiritual work? Is this not work that requires your own and my own transformation? Why do you do your work? Do you do your work for, for God? Be it the work of collecting trash, be it the work of plumbing or doctoring or engineering, or lawyering? Do you see those on a sliding scale as if, as if the gifts that God gave to the garbage collector, the zookeeper, or whatever, the plumber, the, the craftsman, the, the person who didn't go to college, are those gifts less good? Are they less important? Are those people less in their work? Yeah. Jesus chose carpenter. On the other hand, is, is the pastor or the missionary or the pope or the whoever, is it more spiritual just because they talk about more spiritual things sometimes? Can't divide the world up like that. You've got to put it all back together. We can serve God at work by furthering social justice and the kingdom values. We can serve God at work by being honest, sharing the gospel, we serve God at work by doing great work, excellent work. We can serve God at our work by creating beauty, by bringing order. We can serve God at work by working from a, a heart of service, both to God and to man. We can serve God at work by engaging our culture and turning it. We can serve God at work by being grateful and joyful people instead of cynical. We can serve God at work by making a lot of money so we can be super generous. <laughs> the point is not this. The point is not for you to judge your work. The point is to ask yourself, have you taken your work out of the out of the realm of the things that God's in charge of in your life, of the things that God wants to redeem, the things that God died for, the things that God is trying to transform, or not. And if it's not, what are you going to do about it? I'll leave us with three quotes. Two famous, one not. First one is by C.S. Lewis. Imagine yourself as a living house, God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks and the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs need, needed doing. And so you aren't surprised. This is like honesty and, and going to church and maybe giving money, right? But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abdominally and doesn't seem to make any sense. What on earth is God up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come in and live in it himself. Second, from William Deal. If ordinary people can't find any spiritual meaning in their work, they are condemned to living a dual life, not connecting what they do on Sunday morning with what they do the rest of the week. They must discover that the very actions of daily life are spiritual and enable people to touch God in the world, not away from it. Finally, as we recognize through the metaphor of the body of Christ that not all of us are evangelists, God gave a very Jesus gave a very powerful message in John 17 about how and why people would believe in his message. Leslie Newbegin, the missionary theologian, captures it very well here. How is it possible that the gospel should be credible, 
that people should come to believe that the power which has the last word in human affairs is represented by a man hanging on a cross. I suggest that the only answer, the only hermeneutic of the gospel is a congregation of men and women who believe it and live by it. Jesus didn't write a book, but formed a community. Friends, that is true. Until we, you and I, as believers, learn to live out our faith, to bear witness to the kingdom in every aspect of our lives, the work which will take up 50% of our adulthood, and our family which takes a big part of the remainder, then what we do on Sunday will be relatively meaningless. Personally fulfilling, sure. But don't take this the wrong way. God's mission for the church is not your fulfillment. You will be much more fulfilled in heaven with God. The mission for God's church is to bear witness to the kingdom, to share the gospel with those who don't believe. Not only by what they say, but by what they do. And you and I have a responsibility in the way that we work, the way that we present ourselves, the way that we characterize ourselves, the kinds of things that, that we do, the reasons that we do them, to bear witness to the gospel and our jobs. May God bless you and give you the strength to do that this week.